Snead. Can you guys hear me? Any like, closer? Yeah. All right. Um, okay, so what I'm going to be talking about today is advanced deal evaluation. A lot of you guys may be new. Uh, some of you guys may be in this for a long time. But um, what I noticed where I started to get uh, more profit out of my deal was really setting up the system, like Randall said, um, creating a spreadsheet and tracking my costs instead of just kind of throwing these together and saying, oh, well, we spent about this much at Home Depot and about this much on our carpet and this much on our paint and really started to treat this like a business, that's when uh, you kind of step up to the next level. Um, a lot of you guys aren't maybe doing that. At the end of the day, you kind of brag to your friends and you think, oh, we made $20,000 on the deal. In the back of your head, you're like, well, we didn't count everything. We haven't been rounding up. We probably made about 15. Well, that's not treating like a business and you're only, you're only lying to yourself. So what I did is, you know, I did the same thing for a while. Now um, I treat it like a business and I track everything down to the penny. So what I'm going to run through with you is just how we do that. Um, you know, what I'm going to go through is why I do it. Um, we're going to go over the basics about what, what you guys are probably doing right now. Um, and I'm sorry if I go quick. I'm going to try and we're a little bit behind, so I'm going to try to cruise through it. I'm going to do deal evaluation at the end. You guys are getting a handout that if you want me to evaluate a deal at the end, I'll probably try and squeeze in one or two to show you what you know if, if your deal that you have are working on or potential deal is a deal. So let's try and cruise through it. Um, questions at the end. Um, so I'm going to go through what our upfront valuation is, what our calculations are based off of, um, how I'm tracking my repairs, um, what the real details of the evaluation are. What common mistakes you're, you're maybe not accounting for when you're doing a deal. Um, the deal summary about how I'm adding everything up and, and, uh, and you know, where I'm doing my cost to buy, cost to sell, that type of stuff. Um, breaking down every single cost, whether it be a repair, any purchase, every single receipt so I can reference with the accountant. Um, so that goes into accounting. I have all my own accounting. I have my, my accountant's accounting and I reference everything like that. Um, and then graphing so that from a quick view, well, we can tell where we spent our money, where we made a mistake, where we can improve next time, and then we'll go through some case studies and live evaluation. Um, okay, so this is an overview. This is a quick shot of my spreadsheet that I use. Um, if you look over here, um, we, you know, this is just a quick view, and we'll get into all of it. But these are like the main overview of the costs. This is the repairs uh, where we have the repair estimate, the estimated during the process, and then the actual paid totals for each category broken down, and then you know utilities. Miscellaneous closing costs and um, other repairs. Okay, so like I said, you have to treat this like a business, a lot, a lot, not like a hobby. When you get into this, um, you know you got to know what your details are. You know, got, and when you want to get make real money, you got to know what you're making down to the penny. Um, it's going to make easier tracking instead of at the end of the deal when you're trying to put stuff together. You do it every day. You know, we pay our bills on the first and the fifteenth, and you do. Uh, you, when you pay a bill, you enter it into the spreadsheet and it's done. Instead of trying to get lost and remember where this cost was and what you bought at Home Depot that day, when you put it all in there that day, it, it's, you're not relying on your own memory because even though if, you know, I'm young, but I, I can't remember everything. I'm doing too many things all at once. Um, what, el what also helps us is that it finds trends within my own investing, like where we're spending maybe too much money or my estimated repairs versus my actual and why we went over or am I underbidding and underguessing every single project. So this, this spreadsheet and tracking helps do that, um, which, which also in turn helps me easily identify my problem areas. Um, then it also has a quick, quick reconciliation with the accountant. So I'm not spending two weeks getting go emailing back and forth to the accountant. It's like literally 10 minutes, I'm going, I'm missing this, this, and this, or you're missing this, this, and this. Why? And then we figure it out so that we know um, it prevents us missing things, it prevents people stealing from us, it prevents the contractor or the handyman from going and buying stuff for his own home on our card, which happens whether you know it or not. Um, okay, so um, the basics is, you guys know mail, you know that you have R times 0.75 minus repairs equals what I should pay for it. In this market, um, I'm seeing a lot of competition for deals actually, because deals are tight. There's a lot of investors, the room's pretty full in here. So people are having to pay a little bit more than what they regularly would off mail. So when I know my costs down to the penny, I can pay a little bit more because I know what I'm gonna make on the deal versus a guesstimate of my competitor. Um, there's also Josh and Randall's rule that like Josh talked about last 
uh, last month where they have the $50,000 rule. If your purchase price versus your sale price is $50,000, there's not repairs, then you've got a good spread and that's probably a deal. That works for a quick evaluation, but not necessarily for an in-depth evaluation. So this is a quick shot of just kind of what I have in my spreadsheet of, you know, I have the calculations in there based off of all the history of the deals that I've done, saying this is what I bought it for versus our initial offer, how much we came up, and it calculates everything. Okay, so in our upfront valuation, we have uh, you have to know your values because you can't you can't do anything without knowing your own value. So you got to know R, uh, and you got to know low comparables. Most of you guys know that you got to know what you're going to sell for. You got to know your exit strategy. What a lot of people aren't doing is evaluating their as-is value. Um, you say, well, why do you need to do that? I'm going to go and fix it up. Well, I'll show you a deal at the end of this where we, when we, we, we evaluate deals from every single angle, whether, whether we're going to fix it up to the very top of the market, we're going to only do a little bit of fix-up work, or we're just going to flip it as is. Because there's times where you could have made more money just flipping it and not touching it than if you were to rehab it and go through that whole process. Most people don't know how to evaluate that because they don't know that's an option. If you look at the comps as is, after repair, uh, and, and at the low value, you're going to know what's your be best use of your time. Um, so the tip that I have, and there's going to be a couple tips in here, but a good tip to have is you need to drive, and, and I don't know if Dusty talked about, talked about this, but you need to drive every single active and sold and get into the actives. Because the actives are your competition when you hit the market, and your solds are a good indication of where you're going to be at. Um, you can't do that just from pictures. Pictures give you a good idea, but you're going to be able to really nail in your price to within a thousand dollars usually if you drive all the solds and actives. All right, so if you say drive, do you mean drive by? Mm -hmm. Drive by. You can't get into so solds unless you're really ballsy, but if you want to go knock on the door. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, drive by the solds because you're seeing it in person. You're driving in the neighborhood. You, you'll, you'll see, okay, these, this is comparable neighborhood to my home that I'm looking to buy. Um, and you're getting into the actives because you're not only seeing the neighborhood, but you're also seeing inside the home the actual quality of that home. Um, so going on, uh, what we also have built in, th this, this estimator that I have accounts for short sales too. Uh, and short sales, you know, if it's an FHA on loan, they're going to be, they have, a, they have their um, approval to, to participate letter where they're basing everything off of, you know, if it's on the market for less than 30 days, they're going to accept an 88% net. If it's on the home for 60 days, they're going to accept 84 and 86. If it's on the uh, market for more than 90 days, they're accepting an 84% net. So that's all built in. Freddie and Fannie, they're around 85. Private investors vary anywhere from an 82 to 92% net. Matt? Explain that a little bit more simple. Um, explaining that a little bit more simple is that banks on a short sale, um, they want a net price. So they have a, a calculator built in to their system, which a negotiator goes off of, that's based off the BPO that was done. And a BPO, they want, they're gonna counter you at full BPO value usually. But built into my spreadsheet, I know exactly pretty much what they want. And so I base my initial offer about $5,000 under that. And then that way they feel like they're, I came up in price when really I knew exactly what I was gonna buy it for. But so that off that BPO value, each investor or servicer on a loan Basis, has a different basis for what they want to get in their pocket off the sale. So if you know that number, you know what you're going to buy a house for, if, as long as you get the BPO value. But that's pretty easily that's pretty easily known because whatever the bank counters you at on a short sale after the BPO is done is their BPO value. That's the whole price. That's what they do every time. <coughs> very, very rarely will they not do that. So they're never. You're going to ask what well, the BPO go back at. Sorry, that's confidential information. We can't tell you that. Well, they already told you. So if you want to find out who the, ser the, the servicer is and the investor on the loan, go to this website. Uh, you're going to enter in the, the MIN number, and that's, that can be found on the trustee of the property of the mortgage, the first mortgage. There's going to be like a 16-digit number, I think it is. And you type that in, and they're going to say, well, Wells is servicing this loan, but a private investor owns it, or Wells is servicing it, and Bank of America owns it. That way you can, the more you know about it, the better position you're going to be when negotiating and know what you're going to get out of it. Alright, so this is a uh, repair estimate overview. Um, most people just get a repair estimate. You walk in, after you've done a couple of deals, you can, you can nail down the repairs 
usually within a couple thousand bucks if you're experienced. Um, there's all these templates that you can use for um, you know, carpet base off square footage and stuff like that. And then most people don't care what their estimate was to what they actually spent on. I do that. Not only that, but I also look in this estimated column is what, as I'm going through the deal, if I find uh, mold in the property or uh, broken pipe that I didn't know about and that, and that changes throughout the deal, I want to record that too. That way, at the very end, this last column, I'm comparing what my initial estimate was versus what my actual spend was. That way I can say, okay, well, the last three deals we've been underestimating on carpet or underestimating on paint. We need to estimate more so that we're buying the property right. And then uh, you'll see it later, but we get the exact amount of repairs down to the penny, broken down by each item and also by the, uh, the category. So here is like a breakdown. This is my accounting. You'll see a column right here, which is my accounting column, which means I check that off as soon as I've checked that off with the accountant so that it's all interfaced in between. But we have categories for everything on this column, whether it was bought at Home Depot, when it was when the date was, if it was when it was scheduled, estimated, completed, and when we actually paid the contractor. Um, I track the amounts of it down to the penny, you see everything's exact, and we say it hasn't been paid. That way, if a contractor comes back to me and says, you didn't pay me, I go, well, yes, actually I did. And then also over here, I have a check number. I send the check to him, I say, I paid you. So, you know, what, especially when you're doing it on a con consistent basis, you may be doing, you know, using your inspector, like, you know, six times in six months or even more. Um, they may get it confused, but you don't want to, you don't want to spend your time to prove that you already paid them. For me, it's a couple of minutes. All right, so another thing built in here that you need to know about evaluating a deal is the types of buyers that you're going to be selling this property to. Why do you need to know that? It's because um, you have conventional buyers and FHA buyers. Right now there's an, a 90 day flip rule on FHA. Um, they have a waiver for it, but you can't be making more than 20% profit on the deal. If you are, you need two appraisals. Why does that matter? Well, you're going to run into issues at the end of the deal in the last hour unless you know that up front. So built into my, um, my spreadsheet says, hey, warning, what you're planning to sell this for and what you're planning to buy this for is more than 20%. They don't care about how much money you put into it. They don't care if you're paying seller paid closing costs and you're only making 10 grand, especially on the low end properties because a 20% profit could mean that you're making nothing on it. They don't care about that. It's what you bought it for and what you're selling it for isn't more than 20%. Because if you need two appraisals, you're going to have to count on maybe buying that second appraisal for that buyer so they don't just go, oh, well, I don't want to mess with this, let's go to an easier property. You have to account for these hurdles up front so you can address them and make the deal go through. Um, more often than not, we're making 20% or more on our property, so we have to address this issue on a lot of deals. And we'll say, right when they submit an offer, look, you need to be with the right lender and you need to make sure that they're okay with the fact that we're flipping this in less than 90 days and we're making more than 20% profit. If they're not, talk to my lender, because my lender will do it. And usually we require them to get pre-approved with our lender, because more often than not, their lender's gonna fall out and they'll need to use ours. But the deal doesn't close any later, because my lender will take over with 10 days to go and close the deal. Yeah. Do all that good shit require uh, it's not, yeah, that, if, it, it's, if it's a FHA buyer, it's not all loans, but if you're making more than 20%, it's two inspections, not two inspections, but it's two appraisals. We just have an FHA buyer, and uh, they never talked about percentage. Yeah, if, if they weren't smart so enough to look at chain of title, what was that? It has to be under 90 days. Yeah, it has to be under 90 days for that. So it's a 90 day flip rule. If, if it was, then their underwriter just wasn't smart enough to catch it, and you're lucky. More often than not, they're going to look at chain of title when they pull it, and they don't usually do that till the end of the process, which is going to be hurting you because it could delay your closing. So you just have to be upfront and, and solve those problems ahead of time. Um, all right, so when we get to the meat of the deal, I have a breakdown of everything. I have an estimated column, or I have an estimated column here. I have an actual column here. Um, the major things in this are going to be your purchase price, your commissions, whether you're an agent or you're getting an agent to represent you, what those costs are, if you have concessions, the cost of money, and your sales price. That's all built in here as an estimated so that I can go in and evaluate a deal within two minutes. I just need to know um, 
whatever those sheets that should be passed out to you. If I have that information, I can evaluate the deal and know what I'm going to make on it, what I want to pay for it. Um, and then I can, as the deal goes through, you're never going to be right on with your estimate. So I have a column that overrides these numbers, and this is a, this all these numbers here are a real deal that you know of what our current our costs were, you know our estimated versus what we actually paid on that deal. We paid a lot of miscellaneous costs, but you overrides it so that you get a total at the end of the deal. Commonly missed items um, are going to be referral fees. Not necessarily that you miss them, you know you paid them, but you just don't tally it up in your head when you say to your friend, I made 20, 20 grand when I flipped this deal. Oh yeah, I paid an agent because they brought it to me. Or I paid some, someone a referral fee. Um, you have your closing costs. Usually people aren't necessarily estimating those correctly. Um, you have broker fees. If you are an agent, you're, you're getting your commissions back, but what's your broker taking? Is he taking 30%? taking a franchise fee, all that stuff needs to be built in so you actually know what you made because you may not be making what you think you are. Um, seller paid closing costs, the miscellaneous, I always, always, always have a miscellaneous in there because you're going to have miscellaneous costs you're not accounting for. Hardly anyone accounts for their utilities just because it's just a monthly payment, but that takes away from your profit on income, so it's something you need to account for. Um, and then the negotiation, if you're not negotiating your own short sales or um, but you are doing short sales, you need to account for that because it's something you have to pay if you're paying a negotiator. I don't negotiate my own short sales, but we pay a negotiator, so it's something that I account for. All right, so in summary, we have our cost to buy, our cost to sell, and the big, the big uh, kahuna, which is the net profit that we all love. Um, and like I said, I have built in warnings for the 20% rule, and if the purchase price is more than mail, just because I like to know how often I'm buying property for more than mail. I can say, I do mail at 0.75, some of you do at 0.8, some people do at 0.7, but that can be changed here if you want. But I like to know that I made 30 grand on the deal and I paid more than mail because that means I beat out other investors that may have not bought that deal because it was more than mail. I just, that's just for my own pleasure. But, um, you know, you have <laughs> You love that. I just love it. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so you have all your, your, uh, your spread in here and what you, your total profit is. So, um, this is a breakdown of everything, you know, we have our utilities, what we pay per month, um, and it, it, you break it down by category here, and then also a summary of them here. Um, we have our AV closing costs, which when I, I say AV, there's two sides to every transaction. AV is when you buy it, BC is when you sell it. So I break down those closing costs to make sure to see how much we're spending on it um, on each side. We have our miscellaneous on this one. Um, on this particular deal, we were going to replace the roof, but then we said, ah, let's just patch it, let's get it past FHA. We think that the seller is probably going to request a new roof when they put their offer in and do their inspection. But let's just see what happens. It was a $6,000 roof, we did a $1,000 patch job on it. They came back and asked for a new roof. We said, uh, we'll split the cost with you. We gave them a, gave them a credit for $2,000. They were ecstatic, we were ecstatic. Win-win situation. We made an extra $3,000 off that roof. Uh, I'm going to echo, sometimes we over-improve things that some buyers don't feel are as important, so it's good to... That comes with experience. Yeah. Um, you're, you don't want to cut corners. I was in through a property today that an investor did where he cut corners. Um, I, it's a fine line between over-improving versus under-improving. But he didn't do the basics of you know, changing out the brass knobs with, state, uh, with the brush nickel and having all the lights changed out and you know, that kind of stuff that you, until you've actually sold a home to a buyer and represented them, it's actually a good thing to, I've only done it like twice, and, and showed homes to buyers, it gives you a whole new perspective on what buyers look for. But it, at, over time it becomes, you'll see what people look for versus what they don't look for. <clears throat> but on this one we knew the, the roof was good enough that they're gonna try for it, but they probably, it's not gonna kill the deal. So we, we cut the corner on it, saved us three grand. Um, a kicker on this one, it was by Conwood Heights Recreation Center. We added in a month or a year membership to Conwood Heights if they bought the house. It was 217 bucks. Who knows if it helps sell the house, but you know, it helps. The one I'm doing right now has a utility garage in the basement. I'm thinking, let's go buy a used ATV off of KSL, throw it in the utility garage, because right now the garage doesn't really make sense. It's down in the back, you have to go to a dirt road to get to it. It's just sort of boat, maybe you know, your summer car or an ATV. But that kind of stuff is a miscellaneous cost, but we have to account for it if it's going to be like a sale figure that you're going to put in there. <clears throat> and then we have our interest costs, how much we're paying, who we're paying to, if it's interest or origination as far as upfront. Um, 
Uh, let's see, accounting kind of went over. It's pretty easy. Uh, as far as I go, I get the sheet from my account. I get my sheet. I go over them, check them all off, see where it's missing. It's not a full. When I the reason I wanted the spreadsheet is because the first couple times I did this, I was pulling my hair out for like four weeks of like going through one deal back and forth. Like, why is this missing? Okay, fine, screw it. it I don't really care. At the you know, I made about twenty grand. That's fine with me. Uh, and sometimes it may be with you, but you know, treat it like this. So they, these graphs are built into as far as how we're spending. It's, a, it's they're just for they're not the the you know this isn't going to make you more money, but it's a quick view to see where you're spending your money as far as in percentages of what you pay to your broker, your cost of money. Your, you know, this one upfront closing costs were virtually nothing because you get the credit back for the taxes. So on this deal, I think our closing costs were like six, sixty bucks or something. Um, <clears throat> what we paid on the back end as far as buyer agent commission, seller agent commission we collected back. We have our closing costs, our miscellaneous costs, utilities for a small amount, and our private money guy made some decent money on this one. Uh, this is an overview of how our money was spent over the rehab process. So we started off slow because it was a short sale. We put some money into it up front as far as an inspection, manifest, uh, appraisal. We get all those on a, a, a short sales because we want to give that to BPO agent. So those are minimal costs over here, you know, under a thousand bucks. But as we ramped up the rehab, we got like about ten thousand dollars in a month period, and then we, you know, finish things off and finish off the rehab. So it just gives you a, a time and a quick overview. Um, and then here we have like what our costs to buy, what our, uh, what our what we sold it for, and then it takes our total repair costs compared to those, and then splits all our repair costs up into you know paint the big chunk, Home Depot is a big chunk. Hanging in is a big chunk, and appliance is a big chunk. All of those stuff doesn't matter, but you know, okay, well, let's focus on those big chunks and see where we can cut costs. Um, we want to, at Home Depot, where do I cut costs? I do everything I'm going to buy at the house in one purchase. Why did I do that? Because, uh, where did Cody go? What's it called again? The bid room. The bid room. So if you go to the bid room, you spend 2500 bucks, you get $500 off your purchase off the top. So instead of sending your handyman there every other day, Wasting time, going back and forth. I do a scope of work up front to figure out what everything needs on the property, how many light switches, how many fixtures, how much baseboard, how much sheet pop, how much of everything I buy all at once. Save myself $500 if I spend over 2,500 bucks. So plus, I have an account of what we spent and what I went through on the property of what needs to be done. So if I come back and they come back, well, we're four lights short, we need to go buy more. No, we aren't. It's not my fault. I bought as many lights that are in the house. You go buy them. It's it, you know because stiff, stuff goes missing on these projects, but you don't at the time you won't know. So it's it, all this accounting will save you money in the long run. All right. So uh, this is going to turn out as. Hey Matt, what's the bid room? Is that online? No, it's you just go to the contractor's desk, right, Cody? Yeah. It's a you go to the contractor's desk. And you talk to one of their representatives. They they call it the bid room. You know, it's like. Like VIP. Champagne room. Yeah, the champagne room. <laughs> um, but you just go talk to them. Uh, just, it's pretty much at the contractor's desk, and you just work a deal with them, and they, they negotiate. We, we've gotten, we gotten discounts off of not spending $2,500. We're like, look, we're, uh, we ended up spending twelve hundred. We, we messed up. We didn't do the whole purchase at the start. We did a big one, and another big one. We we'll go, look. We're really tight on this deal. We need to save some costs. Look, we spent over twenty five hundred bucks. Is there anybody who can give me a discount? They went through the whole thing and gave us a discount. So everything's negotiable, guys. Go back to the Home Depot and negotiate. But we're we're forming relationships with guys at the bid counters because we go there so much. So we're spending a lot of money. A lot of money. Yeah, if you put it on your Home Depot card, it's more than three ninety nine. Two ninety nine is uh, no interest for twelve months. Yeah, exactly. We use a Home Depot, Home Depot card too. So those types of tips and tricks, it's gonna save you money, guys. Like 500 bucks off your Home Depot cost. If you go back, I mean, look at that Home Depot cost, 16%. And if I can shave 500 bucks off of that, that's gonna get bring me down a couple of percentage points. So. Kind of along the same lines, you know, 1,500 bucks, whatever, right? 2.99. Buy a gift card. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. If you're new to this. Your first project, and they give you, if you get a Home Depot card the first time you, you make a purchase, it's like 10 or 15% off your total purchase. That's why you should go through and buy as much as you can in front. All right, so we can't even see the numbers that well, but I'll run through them. So this is Nantucket. This is up in Cottonwood Heights. Um, 
just off of Bengal and 23rd. The deal we closed on last month. We bought it. Uh, let's see. Sorry, it's hard to read. Maybe I can read it better on the laptop here. Because I, I think it's supposed to be more updated, but it isn't. Okay. So it was a short sale that we uh, rehabbed. Our initial purchase was 187. Our total rehab cost was 15494.56. Um, our private money that we borrowed was 200 grand. We held the property for how many is that? I think it says 59 days. Um, and our end sale price, 269. Our transaction costs were 25. 348. When I say transaction costs, that's everything else except for purchase price and sales price uh, and commissions and, or, and private money. So that's your closing costs, your, um, your closing costs on the front and back end, your rehab, or not even your rehab costs, but there's a lot of transaction costs. Your commissions that you paid out, the seller paid closing costs that you paid for, it's a huge chunk. If we have a $100,000 spread, which I'll show you on one of the next properties, if we have a hundred thousand dollar spread, we bought it for four, three, fifteen, and sold it for four twenty. There's forty thousand dollars in transaction costs. We only net sixty on a hundred thousand dollar spread. Um, so our total profit on this one was forty three three twenty one forty four. Um, okay, so here's one out in uh, South Jordan. Uh, this is a short sale we have. Also, we got a good BPO on it. We just pushed it through. Um, we put. Where's the rehab cost? This was a good one. 13 grand only into it, and it, well, I think we finished it in a week. Uh, first day on market, we had an offer. Um, private money we borrowed was 320, so we actually got 5,000 more than the purchase price because the, the re, after repair value on it was so good, they were comfortable lending out that high. Um, our time held, it's probably in the 40 day range because not only did we get an offer the first day on the market, we, I think we rehabbed it in one to two weeks. First day on market, and he closed early, so it was a pretty sweet deal. Um, even though he's kind of a picky buyer and tried to screw around with us, I didn't care. But you know, we replaced a couple of driveway pieces because he asked for it in his inspection. Um, and then after uh, after we closed, the constructor, the concrete guy was our friend. He called us up. He goes, "You know that guy afterwards had me, he he uh, wanted to bid, and I'm doing the work to tear up the whole entire driveway and redo it." So he wanted to try and screw us around because he knew we were making money on it. But the reason, these, these are the kind of buyers you get sometimes when they know you're making good money because they can figure out what you're paying. And half the time, the lender doing their loan wants to know what you bought it for for that 20% flip rule. So they're going to tell their buyer that. So you be prepared for that. But if you're selling it for a good price, it won't matter. But that, that's, that's what some of these buyers are doing and what you got to be prepared for. One big tip which you guys should always do Pre-inspect your properties. Have an inspection sitting on the counter when you sell this property because you need to do it because if there's repairs that pop up, these buyers right now are coming through, they're trying to get an inspection and use every item in the inspection as a negotiation point. And they're gonna try and drive your price down. I know another investor that bought a house that had some trusses messed up and he caved 40 grand off the price because he didn't inspect the property. And he, he's, he's worried about selling it quickly because it was a high-end home. I think he paid 406 for it, he had a list at 480, had on a contract in 10 days, and K 40 grand off his list price because he didn't get an inspection. That's, that's, an ex that's an extreme case, but that's what happens because you get worried that the buyer might walk. Don't give them any reason to walk. Do your own inspection, and if there's still problems after you've rehabbed it, fix them, and that way you have a clean inspection on the counter. And they, they're still gonna get their own, and there's gonna be things caught because no inspector's perfect, but at least most of it isn't. And even if there's stuff in the report you don't fix, Circle it, highlight it, say, we aren't fixing this. That way, they're aware of it, and they can't come back and negotiate on it. Um, another case study, this was up in Draper and Sequel Chase. Bought it for 430. Um, rehab cost, that's probably about 15 something, 92 cents. And we sold, our well, private money was for the exact purchase price. Time held was 103 days. So we, this we had this property under contract in one day also. Problem was, there's a deed restriction from the the, um, the short selling bank. They were, I think it was Wells Fargo, 90 day hold. We said, okay, we'll hold it for 90 days. Why was I comfortable doing that? Because I put it in the calculator and I realized that my profit was going to be still $46,000. I paid a ton of money to our private investor at 21, 22,000. 
but it still made sense. So I'm doing the deal. I'm going to hold the property three months, even though I'm paying five grand a month for that property. Makes sense. So that's why you got to do this type of stuff. Um, so now we're going to, if you guys have any deals, does anyone, does anyone fill out their piece of paper that they want to, that you have a deal that you're looking at, but you're not sure if it's a deal or not? I can kind of pull up my spreadsheet real quick. Um, I got five minutes, so I can probably do one. If anyone has a deal, no one has a deal. You guys are looking at any deals, do I? Pete, Pete has one. Pete. <laughs> Pete doesn't need help. He's too smart. I learned so much. Purchase your spreadsheet. Okay, we can talk about that after. <laughs> it's not for sale, but we can talk about that. Um, but everything is for sale for the right price. So, um, so this is the spreadsheet. Um, I can. If no one has one, I will go through a deal. Let's go through the one I just bought. Okay. I got I got one of Yeah. Okay. Go, go Pete's. Okay, Pete, did you have a sheet so you can tell me what what is it worth? Uh, I, you, I was confused on the uh, oh, you want me to provide these numbers? Yeah. Uh, it's worth 120. Okay, after repair value is 120. What is it worth? Um, as is. I don't do that analysis. Uh huh. <laughs> Learn something new every day, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> All right, my guy. Give me a guess. You know what it's probably uh, worth. It's yeah. worth ninety. Okay. And uh, what do you think the low comps for that part be? Eighty, seventy, or eighty? Wait, I'm sorry. What's the question? What are the low comps? So if you pull the lowest comps for that house, and that's you're gonna base your price off of that probably. It's 80. So 80. Low, low comps are over 80. Yeah, that sounds about right. Okay. So if this were a short sale, and you're an agent, right? Yes. What kind of deal is this? Is it a rehab? Is it an REO? Is it a trustee uh, sale? Is it a flip? What is what kind of deal is it? Well, I'm gonna do it as a flip. Okay. And but are you buying as a short sale that you're no, it's, it's actually a regular purchase. Okay, regular purchase. So you're an agent, you represent yourself. Um, so we're going to say there's six percent commissions involved in that deal. Um, it's a rehab. Do you know what your actual purchase price is yet? Seventy-two. Okay, so you're buying for seventy-two. That's going to override the estimates. But look at this estimate. How close it is, just based off of nothing. I have seventy-four, seventy-six. The average estimated between those two. So you know he's pretty close to where that calculator is, just knowing nothing about the deal. Um, Estimated repairs. Um, you, do you use mail at 7.75, 0.8, or 0.7? What is your mail calculation? It depends on how busy I am. <laughs> so <laughs> not, not that busy right now, so 0.75, right? <laughs> okay. Um, someone asked, can you repeat what mail acronym stands for? Maximum allowable. Maximum allowable offer. That's in the third slide if you guys can catch it. But maximum allowable offer, what you'll pay for property in a quick value. Um, are, we, are you guys all enjoying this? We want to move forward. I know we're getting into the end here, but all right. So you're an agent. You're going to collect three percent commissions back, right? Yes. Okay, on the deal because he's an agent. What do you What do you pay for cost of money up front? What's your originating cost? I am lucky. I have a rich friend. I pay zero per, zero points. Awesome. All right, and uh, your closing costs I've estimated at three sixty. Um, that's 05 percent. That's what at least what I'm usually paying because. Even though you have closing costs, you're getting that, uh, that the taxes back, which is a credit to you when you buy a property. So depending on how you structure it, you're usually not paying that much actual closing costs. Um, your broker fee, um, I have it set up for me personally. But you pay 559, right? You're with uh, the greatest brokerage in the world called Randall Wall. 499. 499. 559 is what I pay. I gotta pay that equity. Yeah, yes, right. Yeah. The compliance fee. <laughs> <laughs> you play the go I am my <laughs> Okay, so did you notice this? What did you tell me R was? You told me R was 120, right? Uh, yeah, approximately. You never write, and no one's ever write on R, and you want to sell it quick. So I have an automatic discount built in that you want to probably sell this for 115 as a quick sell. Why? Because we want to be conservative, we want to make money on these deals. So if you're really, really confident that 120 is the conservative number, we can override it over here and say 120. Um, it's going to change the commissions on the fly too. But um, so seller's agent commission, you're representing yourself when you're when you're selling, right? Yes, I. So you're going to use three percent that you pay, but you're paying to yourself, so you collect it back. You received it. 
Then you have uh, your broker fee again, that you're paying five fifty nine four when you resell it. Oh, great. That's lost. It should say it, but that's wrong. Okay, we'll just say it, but you know, we can't enter that in right now. Um, but five fifty nine would be put there. You're gonna pay a buyer's agent commission three percent or three and a half because you're so nice. I usually pay three, but Josh Christensen told me that recently he's seen some has had some good luck with three and a half. Okay, so uh, we'll do you want to do three? Three and a half. Okay. Okay, and uh, you're in, in this low price of a property, you're paying seller for like closing costs. You may even pay, see I have a, I have a deep, uh, this warning right here that popped up, should be three and a half. Because you're, in, because you're below about 130, you're gonna pay three and a half percent seller pay closing costs because you drop in that low price range, that's where the lenders are gonna have. Closing costs are more. They have more, yeah. It doesn't work out the percentage when you get too low. So uh, it's gonna be three and a half. Uh, so I'm gonna change this to all right, so you have your closing cost, which is estimated. You have your miscellaneous cost, which may be small. Utilities. Um, I'm basing utilities off of a monthly. It's about a, I'm saying, I think it's in there, 175 a month is about what you're going to be spending as long as your contractor doesn't leave all your lights on at night and blast the heat because they're cold. Keep the windows open. Yeah, keep the windows open with the heat on. Um, that's one thing. That's why this works because if people don't pay attention, you'll spend. We had a $500 water bill one time. Oh. Yeah, in two months. Gotta love the Draper. Um, Did somebody leave the I think there's there? a switch for culinary versus non-culinary to water your lawn. We were watering our lawn with really good water. <laughs> <laughs> How long are you gonna hold this property? Conservatively. Unfortunately, they're putting that 90-day deep restriction, so it's gonna be at least four months. Okay. So, that's pretty much, you don't have any private money costs though, right? Because you're, again. Uh, let's say 9%. Okay. 9% of what you're going to make? <laughs> or 9% on the purchase price? That's Just correct. to pay yourself? Or pay no, I pay the rich friend. Oh, at the end. Okay. This is 12. Uh, for some reason, this is locked right now, too. But right. that's going to be pretty dang close. So. All right, so here's a warning that popped up. You're gonna have to worry about selling for more than 20%, so be aware of that. Um, your total cost, oh, how many are, I forgot the big guy, uh, what's the repairs? This is a very unique one for me. It's, it's in really good shape. My repairs are gonna be 10,000. Okay, just for time's sake, we're not gonna break it down by each category. I'm not gonna ask how much you paid all. But he's experienced, so he knows his repairs. So what'd you say, sorry? Let's say 15,000. Okay. <laughs> 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 you didn't tell me 12 hours with 15 minutes, so. <laughs> Are you mowing the lawns yourself? <laughs> Always do, man. Okay, so your total cost by 70, you have 15 repairs, your gross sell for your suites after everything. Um, you don't have a negotiator on it, it's just a regular organic deal. You'll make 20 on it. Great. And if you sell it quick or you didn't have a deed restriction, you make 21 on it. What about the six? Up to six, dropping out to eighteen. Because your cost of money is cheap. Usually, your your profit's going to bear or fluctuate a lot more on your money, yeah, but you don't have any origination costs. So that's and and also your cost of money is cheap. But I'm lower price homes here. You don't get paid as hard for holding it longer, which is why you can sometimes ask for a higher price. But I don't ever do that anymore. I list them low and sell them quick. Every time it works. You, that's what we can do too. We can go okay. So let's say let's take this out. We do one fourteen. At two months, okay? That means I'm gonna not try and get the high price for it. I'm gonna try and sell quick, which means even you're gonna rehab it, you don't have a light rehab, so you're gonna rehab it in less than two weeks. You're gonna put it on the market, and you're gonna get an offer in less than two weeks, and you have 30 days close. So you're gonna hold this two months exactly uh, because you listed it quick at 114, okay? Let's now say I thought my house was perfect, it's better than everyone else in the market. And I'm gonna sell for 125 and I'm gonna hold out six months. Wait, actually, what was the profit? We let's look at the profit real quick. Wait. Okay, so we're at 16 that way. I'm at 125, one, two, three, but I'm holding it six months. You it may be better for you to try, maybe because your your holding costs are so cheap. But yeah, so you would if you actually did get a higher price because your holding costs are so cheap on this lower end property, you may want to try. That's that's a judgment call, but I can tell on the fly. But I wouldn't. Because buyers like fresh meat. They see a well-priced property 
that looks good for a cheap price and they're all over it. You could wait three months and you could drop it down to that same price and have the same exact buyer, buyer looking, but because it says 90 days on market and it's not a brand new listing, they aren't paying for it. They go, what's wrong that no one else paid for it and bought it for that much? That, that, why don't, that's why I don't want to buy it. Someone else may be smarter than I am. That's what they say to themselves, guys. When you list it low right away and you have your built-in profit, don't get greedy. He's going to make 20. If, if he sells it, if it is at 115 and sells it the first 30 days, he's making 20. That's the goal on that one. I'm right. I, I'm making assumptions, but that's that's pretty much how I evaluate a deal, you know. <laughs> so you're um, saying don't list it until you know for sure you can sell it the next day if you have to, like. Um, not necessarily. Not not don't list it, but list it at a price that you know is going to be attractive to people. My rule is be the best house on the market for the cheapest price. That doesn't that doesn't hold true in every single scenario, but. For the most part, you want to be, it, there's different classes of homes, but for your class, if you're a remodeled home, you're the high end of the market, you want to be the best priced home in the high end of the market, uh, and also look as good or better than the rest of the homes. If you did a mid-range rehab, you want to be the best price in the mid-range, and look the, look the best or better. If you're selling it as is at low, you want to be the best price, and sell for low. My rule of thumb, or what I've been doing to sell my properties quick, is, Keeping my cost down, and this is, I play with my numbers. So let's say you wanted to put 15 into it. Well, I'll play with my numbers and I'll say, well, there's mid range properties, and I'll look up all the comps. This is why I pull the as is comps and the after repair comps, because that Nantucket property I showed you, there was comps, and we sold it for 270. There's comps as high as 310, but we would have to put like 45 to 50 into it to get it up there. And then you have a longer holding cost because you're rehabbing it longer. You have longer holding cost because the buyers are pickery up there. And so I put it through the evaluator and I said, what if we put 15 into it? What do we do then? And we, let, and we priced it at 270 because I know it's going to sell quick because buyers like to get into a nice neighborhood for the cheapest price possible. So I listed it low, I did the minimal repairs, and I need more selling it for less and putting less into it. Would you like to do that? Yeah, because you get on to the next one. I'm out, I'm in, I'm out, I'm on my way. I made more than I thought I would. It's a win, 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 and win. So <laughs> that's why this is important, guys. No one does their as is value. They say, we're in the business of remodeling. So let's fix it up for the very top of the market. That doesn't always work. You want to have a nice property, but not always price at the top of the market. You know, Nice for its class. There's three classes. So any other questions? I don't want to keep you guys. I know it's late and getting tired. Stay around afterwards. Yes. Fill out the form if you guys do have a deal, but you're just too scared to talk about it. I have a gift card for you because you did it. So come up and grab it. <laughs> Chili's. Um, but if you guys want me to buy you a deal or run through this kind of deal, a scenario with you, whether you're, you know, you want to say, well, where should I sell, sell this at? Fill out that form. I just need those numbers, and I can tell you what to do with it. So put your contact information at the bottom. Turn it into me. I'll call you. When I have time, if I ever do, but I work till 2 a.m., so it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, thanks.